Out of all the musicians that messed with it, no one could find the fault. Because it was made unique, customized, and no one really knows how to fit it. So they all gave up. Finally, after a few weeks of it not playing, a very older gentleman showed up at the church. He said, why wasn't the pipe organ used? They said, it's not playing right. He said, well, let me try to fix it. Well, since it was lying there for a few weeks, they exhausted all efforts. They go, went ahead and agreed to let the old man try his hand at it. So for two days, the old man worked night and day in total silence. Barely took any breaks. Mm -hmm. The church workers, when it's in fact, they're getting nervous. They're like, what? maybe he's making it even worse. Maybe he doesn't even know what he's doing with it. Right. So on the third day at noon, the whole town heard it play even better than what it was playing before. It gave off the best music after so many years. All the village gathered to hear. The old man was sitting at the organ playing it. And after he finished, they had to ask. They said, how did you manage to restore this magnificent instrument? Even the world's experts could not. The old man said, 60 years ago, I created that instrument. And now I came back to restore it. So Jesus created it. Restore you. They can help, but they're not going to totally restore you. Yeah. Dear Father, I just ask that you anoint my mouth with words of wisdom, words of truth, words of encouragement. Father, make me a vessel tonight for your truth and wisdom. Just anoint me right now with the words that I need to give. Give me the message. Give a clear message. Give me a powerful message. And if anybody needs to hear this message, which I'm positive a lot to, Lord, please put it into their hearts and lift them up. Let them know everything that they have got taken from them. You are going to restore. You're going to give it back to them, Lord. You're going to give it back to them and then some. Their cup's going to overflow, Lord. They're going to have some extra to give to others, Lord. Just put that in their hearts and everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. See, you're going to get it back. God says you've been through so much. The only way I can put you back on track is to restore your soul. I'm going to restore your soul. I'm going to bring you back to who you were meant to be before you went through everything you went through. When I look at Jake right now, God's restored him. He fixed him so great that he doesn't even look like he's been through what he's been through. God's put him through fire, but he came out and he doesn't smell like smoke. See, he says, I'm going to restore you from all the years you've lost being bitter and angry in a world of sin. He said... Your later day is going to be greater than your former day. Amen. Amen. See, I want everyone just look at your neighbor and say, I got to get it back. <laughs> and if you got it back, say, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> See, we got to get it back. He's going to give it back. When somebody's at a rock bottom, they got to get it back. He said, I got to get my mind back. I got to get my health back. I got to get my drive back. I got to get my faith back. I got to get my family back. I got to get my marriage back. I got to get my God back. You got to get it back. He's going to give it back. See, you might walk through the valley, as I mentioned last sermon, and I walk through the valley, but when you're walking through the valley, you don't let the valley walk through you. Amen. See, God's getting ready to release some gifts this year. We just seen some gifts this year. See, God's getting ready to take us all to the next level. God's getting ready to let Jake play these drums like he's never played before. God's getting ready to let Seth sing in a way he's never sung. God's getting ready to let Brian teach music like he never thought he was teaching. God's getting ready to let our praise team sing so great that the angels are going to cry in heaven when they hear it. See, God's going to give it back. 
I got another story that's going to go right along with this. One of the dangers facing a sheep is it becomes cast. And I never really knew this, but the challenge that's facing a shepherd is to make sure his sheep do not become cast. So you're wondering, what is cast? Well, cast is when a sheep that is turned over on its back, and because of lack of agility, and because its wool has got so thick, it's unable to get back up by itself. And if not helped, it will die on its back in that position. The condition is not uncommon unless the shepherd keeps diligent watch over his flock. A cast sheep will die or fall victim to predators. The shepherd must restore such sheep. He must help the cast sheep get it on its feet and regain its equilibrium. Now I'm telling you right now, I was a cast sheep. I had dirty wool on me. I was laying flat on my back. But there's somebody, there's only somebody, there's one person, and that's our God. And He got me back up. I got my equilibrium back. I'm walking straight now. I'm walking good now. And again, I was cast. The predators, I was falling victim. I was laying there. But just like Peter, as I was sinking, I said, Lord, save me. Now I wondered, has that ever happened in real life? What's the best story for that? And the odds of this, Brittany sent me the story. I, it was on a Facebook post. It had nothing to do with religion. She just sent me the story of a sheep that was. It went six years without being sheared. Yeah. So I dug into it further. It was one in 17,000 on a wool farm in New Zealand. The name of this sheep was Shrek. So once they found it, it was so hideous, so mangled, so disconfigured, it wasn't even recognizable as a sheep. It went six years. The reason it went so long is that the land was so huge, it found a cave to hide in. It would come out, eat, go right back to the cave. For six years, it was never sheared. There was enough wool on the 10-year-old Shrek to produce 20 men's suits. Approximately 60 pounds. Again, when he was found, he was not immediately recognized as a sheep. Now, God spoke to me at the very end of this article. In the hands of a good shearer, the whole process is over just a few painless minutes. This sheep that went through and picked up all the dirt, all the debris, all the thorns, everything that was tangled in its wool. I looked up how long it took. In 20 minutes, one of the world's best shearers sheared him. He made him like brand new. And I'm here to tell you, God can do it in seconds. When you walk around and you pick up your baggage, when you pick up this hatred, he says, let me shear it off. Let me shear off this anger. Let me shear off this heartache. Let me shear off your burdens. You picked up an addiction. Let me shear it off. You're an alcoholic. Let me shear it off. You got to sin. You want to have premarital sex. Let me shear it off. See, it's not how far we've come. When I wanted to speak this message, when I wanted to give my testimony, I was going to put, look how far I've come. Look what I've done with my life. And just like that, God struck me down. He put it in my heart. Right, I was, I was writing this by hand. He put it in my heart. He said, it's not how far you have come, Trevor. It's how far I have brought you. <laughs> no credit for where I'm at right now. I take zero credit. You see, I used to think I was bad. I used to think I was sly. I used to think I was tough. But I wasn't tough. You see, God brought me here. He protected me. The reason I'm not dead, the reason I'm not in prison, the reason I don't have HIV AIDS, the reason I'm not hanging out at a bar, the reason I'm right here before you is because God brought me here. When I was out there, They comfort me. So every time
time I wanted to act like a fool, every time I wanted to be a little crazy, you see there's a hook on the end of that staff. Right. And God was quick to reach out, grab me, and bring me right back to where I needed to be. Isaiah 45, 3. We'll go to scripture. This is, this is a prime example of how he's going to restore you. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Who calls me and says, Trevor, I brought you here. Who calls you and says, good child of mine, good servant, I brought you here. You see, God has some stuff in places that nobody knows about. Right. Amen. Hidden treasures. Amen. God has some stuff that nobody could ever know about. When he sent the flood, people think he made it rain for 40 days. Well, see, this is what people don't catch. He didn't create the rain. He didn't just make it fall from the sky. If you dig into it, if you look at Scripture, it says He broke up the systems yeah. of the deep. So he, he had some pockets of water that nobody knew about. Right. He broke it up. He yeah. brought it up. And then he brought it down. Oh, yeah. You see, he had some pockets hidden for a time that he needed it. I believe God has some pockets of blessings that nobody knows about. He has a pocket just waiting for you. When you're ready to receive it, he said, I got it right here in my pocket. Just let me know when you want it. Just let me know when you're going to live the right life. I got it right here in my pocket. You see, he's got hidden treasures of darkness. He has wealth in secret places. He's ready to give it to you. Are you ready to walk and live for Him? See, when God gets ready to work, He can do it without any support. He can work in adverse conditions. He can work in Cambridge, Ohio. He can work in Byesville, Ohio. He can go into a drug addict's house, pick them off. There might be OD and they might be on their last breath. He can put it in their heart. This is your time. Here I am. You're laying on your back. I see all the wool on you. I see you can't get up. I see the needle in your arm. Come on, let me shear it off. Let me pick you up. Let me lift you up. See, Jesus said, I am a root. I am a root springing up from dry ground. Yes. It says that I am God. See, when God wants to spring up, He don't need any rain. He's a root yes. springing up from dry ground. See, He says I can do this because I am God. Nobody appointed me to be God. Nobody promoted me to be God. Nobody voted and said you're God. I can't be demoted. I can't be fired. I can't be cast out because I am Somebody said, here's a ball. 
cares, my ball. Take it. Take it. I don't want it for myself. I want it for the world. And that's how the church is going to grow. Once you get to where I am with Christ and you just feel so filled. You feel so filled. You don't keep it in. You don't keep it in. You let it pour out to the others. And I don't care where they are. They can be in any place. They can be any time. You can be seeing someone broke down on the side of the road. You help them change the tire. And then you say, let me tell you about my Lord Jesus Christ and how he changed my life. I don't know if you know him, but I want you to know him. I don't care if you deny him. I'm going to tell you about him. And you see, I was doing that before I even announced Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I realized I was doing that all my life. And I have a true story that goes right with that. Two months before I came to this church, I was out searching for a job. I had little money. I'd wake up early in the morning to go put in applications. I'd go to all the tax uh, staffing agencies. At 8 a.m., there's a homeless man sitting right in front of the Kmart that shut down, right on the grass bank, right where the cars park. It's very early. The sun was coming up. I had $20 to my name. I said, I'm going to go get him Burger King. I went and got him food. After I bought that, I had $15 left. I said, I'm going to give him $10 and give him Burger King. Well, here's the catch. I got there. I was so happy. I just wanted to change his life. I wanted to be a blessing to him. He said, I don't want that. He said, I don't want the Burger King. He said, I don't want the money. He just kind of just wanted left alone. So what I did is I sat down next to him. I just started talking to him. I asked him what brought him here, where he's from, what he's doing. The sun was coming up. And he said, you know, I'm homeless. But it's little moments like this that I really enjoy. He's like, I'm just sitting here, to be honest with you, Trevor, I have nowhere to go. I have nothing to my name. I have no responsibilities. But at this point in my life, I just want to enjoy this sunset. He said, I didn't want your food. I didn't want your money. And we talked for over a half hour. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget this in my, to this day. When I got up, he said, Trevor, my friend. He said, you have given me something that no money could ever give, that no person has ever given me. He said, you gave me your time today, and you are my friend. He said, you gave me time, and you gave me friendship. And that's what I need people to realize. Everyone that's lost, everyone that's a sinner, they're just sitting there lonely. They don't want helpings. They don't want blessings. They just want an ear. They just want someone to hear them. They just want friendship. He said, Trevor, as you leave, you are my friend. Don't you ever forget that time is more precious than what money will ever give you. Yes. So now just to practice what I preach, I have a living example that I've never let that get, get away from my mind, away from my heart. Three, I believe three, three and a half weeks ago, I'm looking for a spot to fish. Brittany's out of town. She's with friends in Columbus. I'm just driving around looking for a new spot. I see my friend Cody fishing all alone. Nobody around. I drove past. And that's where God went to work. That's where my mind remembered what the, what the homeless man said to me. I turned back. Wanted to look to make sure he was actually truly alone. Drove past again. And then that's where the fight set in. Should I really go talk to him? Should I really? The old me would never do this. Yeah. The old me's finding a fishing spot yeah. to myself. I just want to sit here. I don't want bothered by nobody. I want to be as far away as anybody. 
anybody that I can be. But God grabbed me. He said, you turn your car around. You drive down there and you be a friend. I didn't mention religion for the first two hours. I didn't mention God for the first two hours. I said, how's your life going? I said, how's your family going? I wanted to know what was, how his life, what his situation he was in. I gave him friendship. I gave him an ear. I gave him an ear. There you go. There you go. After all of that, we were packing up, we were leaving. He let me know he was looking for work. He was looking for a job. Right away, I said, I can, I can give you a job. I can give you a strong recommendation. I can get you right in there. You see, that's what God can do. He had 30, 40 people on the waiting list to get in my work. God took his name from the bottom of the pile and he put it right on the list. God. I never mentioned Jesus. I was in my car. I was turning my key. <laughs> and I said, I have to. I don't care. I have to. And you can ask Cody. I went, got out of my car, went right up to him. And I said, do you believe in God as your Savior? Do you believe in Jesus Christ yes. dying for our sins? Yes. He said, I used to go to church. I used to be in it. My family used to take me. Immediately, I went back to my car. I grabbed our pastor's car. Yep. I said, this is one of the wisest, best, greatest anointed men that I know. Yes. Amen. You should come here and speak. I didn't mention myself once. I said, you should come here and speak. It's changed my life. He's changed my life forever. I gave him the car. I never asked him. I never said. I never forced it on him. I never pushed it on him. You see, I set a little fire on him. There you go. Two days later, he gets the information. He's going to be hired in at my work. He's going to be starting for my work. Oh, right away, God put it in his heart. He said, God's done all this for me. He said, Trevor, I want to go to church with you. He said, I'm going to start going to church with you. Sometimes when you want to save people, you're going to have to ask for help. Lifeguards who have rescued swimmers from drowning, they know better than most victims that they tend to fight their rescuers in hysteria of the terrifying moment. In uncontrollable panic, they will even pull their rescuers yes. under the water. Yes. Now reason, reason should tell them that the lifeguard goes under, my only hope of living goes under. Yeah, that's right. But the drowning person isn't thinking reasonably. You see, the same is true when a believer attempts to rescue somebody who's floundering spiritually because their faith has suffered. But again, I just preached this. They're sinking, but they haven't sunk. They're going down, but they aren't out. Sometimes you need to call on God to help you bring him up. Sometimes you need to say, God, I can't do this on my own. He's fighting me. He's bringing me down with him. Lord, I need you. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. Don't just save me. Save him. Lord, save us. We'll go back to Scripture. James 5, 19-20. My brothers and sisters, if one of you shall wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. When Jake did the sinner's prayer, he said, Lord, forgive me for my many sins. It says right here, he's going to cover a multitude of sins. A multitude. Not just a couple of sins. Not just a little bit of sin. He's going to cover your many sins. Yes. Again, James addresses a response for those who wander off the path. If any wonders and someone turns their back, this ministry is not limited 
to the pastor. It's not limited to me. It's not limited to the elders. We as a church have to reach out and we have to grab this community. We have to lift them up. Everyone thinks people's just going to walk into church. Everyone's just going to come into church. You see, God's going to bring them to church. But God is going to use you to bring them to church. He's going to put it into your heart. Somebody's going to be fishing. And God's going to say, I want you to go fish for the person that's fishing. You see, growth requires prayer. Yes, amen. Yes. That's where we lack. We need the faith back in Scripture because of our belief. I believe this church is starting to really believe we can grow. Amen. And it's showing. Amen. I believe the ball is rolling. Amen. Matthew 17. 19 to 21. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this does not go except by prayer. And fasting. Yes. So we gotta have a vision. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta have a belief. Yes. And we gotta see yes. so big. Yes. So big. I wanna show you how big we need to see. I wanna thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so much for being new. Thank you so much. I'm sorry it's crowded. I'm sorry. Somebody's sitting over there in the chair. I'm sorry we're doing the best we can. I thank you so much for coming. Oh, my God, these people, thank you. It's so good to see you. Bring your friends. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. We world to 
sit there and say, I got him back. I got him back. You see, she gave birth to him. She cared. She's the only woman to say, I carried the same child twice. I got him back. I can feel him. You see, when he was inside her from the womb, I feel him now. And then for the second time, the only time ever, I got him back. Thank you, God. I just feel him again. I got him back. You see, I want to tell everyone here tonight, it don't matter what you lost. It don't matter what you gave up. If you just hold on, if you just walk in faith, if you just live for God, if you just wake up and count your blessings, if you just keep waking up with determination in the right mental state, you're going to get it back. You're going to say, I got it. The last restoration I'm going to mention, Peter was restored. You see, Peter blew it. And that's for certain. He denied the Lord three times. In John chapter 21, we see a gentle way Jesus, the gentle way Jesus restores Peter to fellowship and purpose. He does the same for us. So did you ever fail Jesus? Again, John the Apostle said in John 1, 8 to 9, if we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Right. And the truth That's is right. not in us. That's That's right. Right. One of the most common experiences we as Christians share is the reality that we will fail. That we will fail. No matter how hard we try, we will do things that are against the character of God. Yes, we have forgiveness. John goes on to say, if we confess our sins, yes. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us yes. from all unrighteousness. Yes. Yes. He's getting the shears out. Our wool's overtaking us. I can barely move. I picked up some thorns. I picked up some branches. Again, I confess it. I confess it. Yeah. Take yes. it off me, God. Yes. Get the shears yes. out. Take yes. it off me. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. So again, Peter goes back to what he knows. That's fishing. But just as with us, once you turn your life over to Jesus, you're looking for fruitfulness in your old life, it's going to be like fishing without any bait on your hook. Yes. Right. But you can be sure you're never going to catch a thing. Mm -hmm. So here they are, empty-handed. After a long night's work, and then in the dawning light, they hear a voice calling from the shore. Someone standing there, offering some fishing tips. Verse 4 to 6. You see, everyone knows the worst question to ask me and Brittany. Have you caught any fish? <laughs> That's only when we haven't caught any fish. <laughs> See, they didn't even bother talking about the ones that got away. They just straight up and said, No, we haven't caught any fish. Try it on the other side, Jesus says, and you will, some. See, he didn't promise what they're about to get. He says, you will some. Yeah. It's unusual that these professional fishermen would take the advice from a landlubber. You see, Jesus, he didn't let them know he was Jesus. He disguised himself. They just came as an old man talking crazy on the side of the beach. Yeah. They're professional fishermen. They've done this all their lives. They've caught thousands of fish. Yeah. And this this guy on the beach says, try the other side. Amen. Amen. Then you will soon. But you see, Jesus tells them to go to the other side that they shouldn't expect to catch fish on. And finding a lot more than some, they get a haul. 153 fish. 
And notice that John remembers that to detail. Every single one. He even recalls all the names. Of, he doesn't even recall all the names of the disciples. But he remembers the detail. 153 fish. See, he directs our lives to work in areas where you wouldn't normally go to find fruit. In unexpected places. So just because Jesus prompts you to work in places that you wouldn't bear mammon amount of fruit, you should go do it anyways. That's right. Again, he's in charge of the he's in charge of the catch. Just because I didn't think somebody fishing all alone would give their heart to God and want to live for Him, he's in charge of the catch. That's right. I plant Apollo's waters, but God. Come on. But God. But see, as soon as John sees the unusual hall, he realizes the stranger on the shore is no stranger at all. He realizes it's Jesus, the Son of the living God. Amen. So after Peter denied him three times, after Peter failed him, after Peter let him down, John notes that it was he who recognized that Jesus, but that Peter throws on some clothes, he jumps into the water, and he left John to pull all the fish in. That's probably why he remembered those 100 <laughs> But again, I do love the fact that despite his failures, despite him letting down Jesus, he rushes to Jesus' side. Scripture says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. So some of us is letting down and we're still hiding on the boat. There he is out there. I don't want to deal with him. There he is right there. I don't want to go talk to him. I'm telling you right now, if you've wandered off from him, if you let him down, you need to throw on some clothes, jump in the water, stand in front of him soaking wet and say, here I am, God. I'm sorry I let you down. I'm sorry I denied you, God. Father, I confess my sins. Father, I confess that I wasn't worthy for you. Father, forgive me. Yeah, and again, you'll get it back. So just to close, we do need to restore our church. During the last 10 years, church attendance has fallen by 9.5% population has swelled 11 percent. The United States ranks third behind China and India in terms of unchurched people. Of the generation born between 77 and 94, only 4 percent are Christians. 65 percent of those are born between before 46. Not one county in the United States has a higher percentage of church people than they did 10 years ago. Not one county. And I'm here to tell you, I have a mustard seed in front of me, and I'm here to tell you in 10 years, there's going to be a county that has a higher percent. We need to believe that is Guernsey County is going to have a higher percent. We need to go out and reach people and get them in here. And somebody's going to say, have you ever heard of Guernsey County? Somebody in California is going to say, can you believe out of all these counties, Guernsey County is the only county that has a higher percentage now than they did 10 years ago? This is going to be an example. That's going to start a fire. We're going to keep the fire burning. As the pastor said, we're going to start a spark. It might just be a little flicker. It might just be a little teeny spark, but that's going to go to another county. That's going to go to another county. So many counties make the state. So many states take the nation. So we're going to rise up as a nation. I want to say we need a revival. We need a revival. We can't give up. We can't give in. We need one last hurrah. Just one last hurrah. You don't know if you have a second win if you don't go to the second win. If you give up on your first win, how can you know if you have a second win? We need to get the second win. We need to get a revival like Billy Graham gave us. We need to get a revival like Charles Brunson gave us. We need to get a revival. And I want to say everybody out here that leaves tonight, no matter where you see them, no matter where you go, if somebody doesn't know Jesus,
Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want you to fish for them. I don't want you to cast a little hook with a little bit of bait. God's giving you a net. I want you to throw a net. I want you to get a haul. I want you to get 153. I want you to get 1,153. I want you to get 10,153. I want you to get a million and 153. I'm going to close with that tonight. And I do want to ask if there's anybody here at all, anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there's no better time than right now. Yes. There is no better time than now. 